Hey, today I'm going to show you how to build better automations. These are foundational principles that work in any automation tool, whether it's Make or Zapier or NA10, and they also apply to code as well. These are proven ideas. I made over 128K in profit last month building and teaching them to others, and you don't need any technical knowledge in order to get up and running with them. All you need is an open mind and a willingness to learn. Ready to go? Let's get started. Now, the first principle is probably the most important, and it's also the simplest one to do. It's start at the end. So anytime you're building a system, don't start at the beginning and then logically try working your way from node or module one to node or module two to three to four to five. Ask yourself, what is it exactly that I'm trying to do here? What is the end result of this automation? What is the last node or module that I'm going to need to add to this in order to make it work? Try and answer those, those questions and then just skip all the way to the end and then build the thing that you want to do at the end, assuming you have all the information from previous steps and confirm that that works before wasting your time getting all the way up there only to realize that it doesn't. Now, I've built hundreds of automations at this point, both for myself and for others, and this is one of the highest ROI approaches that you could use to building any system. If you zoom out a little bit, this same approach doesn't just work in coding. It works in basically everything. It's just called reverse engineering. So you look at what you want, okay, this is the start, and then this is the end. You look at what you want, which is over here, and then you just say, okay, now I have what I want. What's the second last thing that I'm going to need to do before I get the last thing? Okay, I'm going to have to do this. All right, great. Once I'm done with that, you know, how do I, how do I generate the information I need to do that? Well, I got to do this. Okay, great. Now, in order to do that, what do I have to do? N minus three, and so on and so on and so forth. You basically just start at the last chain and you just work your way back progressively, filling in the blanks as necessary until you get to the thing that you need in order to like trigger your flow, for instance. If you take this approach to building automations, not only are you going to save so much wasted time and energy in exploring dead ends that don't lead anywhere, but you're also going to build a lot tighter of a flow because kind of like the way to think about automations really is like, if you're at the beginning, you can build so many different ways to do the same thing. Okay, I'm just going to pretend that, I don't know, pretend this is like a tree or something. And I don't know, I think I locked something here. Pretend that this is like a, like a tree or something, okay? Essentially, what you're going to want to do is, um, you know, okay, if this is the start. You start here. Your path may be like this to get to the end. But you could also do this. You could also do this. And you could also do this. The point that I'm making is when you're at the start line looking forward, there's like a million billion things that you can do, okay? But if you're at the end looking backwards, you only ever see this one trailing path to get back there. Do you, do you know what I mean? Because we're assuming the system's already been built. And the benefit to this as well is you can typically eliminate a lot of these weird sort of, I don't know, detours that you might take along the way. So realistically, what you see looking backwards is you see a much straighter line path from end to start. And I know that this is all theoretical. I'll make it a little more concrete in a second. But this typically means uh, fewer modules or nodes in your flow. It means fewer operations or executions. It means less wastage. And ultimately, it just leads to a much better and easier building experience. Because I think of systems in this way, I'm typically able to build systems that other people might take, you know, 5, 10, 15 hours to do in like 30 minutes. Because I always just ask myself, what are we doing here? What's the end result? How do we go from the end result to the second last result? How do we go from the second last result to the third last result? And so on and so on and so forth. So I'll give you guys a quick example here with my um, probably the most recent build that I did in N8N anyway on my channel. And, you know, if you're a follower of this channel, you'll probably recognize this. But essentially what I did was I used Appify to scrape new Instagram reels. Let me just get my little drawing tool over here one second. I used Appify to get a bunch of Instagram reels. Okay, so these are IG reels. And then once I had my Instagram reels, I deduplicated them using a Google Sheet. 
Basically just wanted to see if I'd already had them. And then I added them to a Google sheet if they were new. I then downloaded the video. Okay. I then transcribed it using whisper. I then generated a bunch of suggestions for better content. I then searched perplexity. Then at the very, very end of this, I wrote a new script basically of that Instagram reel. And then I added it to a database. Now I'm going through this step by step just to show you guys that it looks pretty simple when we're, you know, we have the finished product or finished system in front of us, right? Because we're just go, well, of course you're going to do this before you're going to do that, right? And that just makes sense. But when you're building something and you're looking forward and you, you don't know, like literally anything except for this, right? Like th this is all I knew at the beginning, everything on the left-hand side of this. When, when, when you're over here in La La Land, right? You have no idea. I mean, this could go 50 million different ways. So let me show you my approach to building this system. Basically, if I were rebuilding this, or if I were building this today, or building a, a similar one anyway, the very first thing that I would do is I would zoom way in over here to the update entries, the last Google Sheet, and you don't even need to know what the system does. Just kind of pay attention to the shape of this. I know at the end, I'm going to have to do some sort of database update, right? So logically, what do I need in order to make that happen? Well, I need a database. So I'd go and I'd make the database first, right? So now I have this database. Okay, great. What do I fill it with? Okay, well, I, I want to fill it with the script. So I need to make sure I could write the script. So what do I do next? Well, I'd actually go ahead and I'd try writing a script with a prompt. I'd insert my own test data there. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd prompt engineer all day long. I'd, I'd do training runs and give it context and all that stuff. I'd basically make sure, hey, in a perfect world, if I provided it all the best information, could I write a banger script? And if the answer to that question is yes, then I move on one step back. Then I say, okay, well, great. Let me think. What information... Or how could I get the information that I need to provide to the model in order to have it write me a good script? Okay, I need to search perplexity. Hmm. How do I get information in such a format that I can search perplexity? Okay, well, I need to use this other step. And I just work my way step by step backwards um, until I make it basically to the very, very beginning of this flow, which is the schedule trigger. So that's a quick example in N8N. Um, in make.com, this is a quick flow that I built a while ago that essentially just scrapes YouTube videos from my channel, and then it creates a Google Drive folder and adds them to a ClickUp pipeline that I built. The idea behind this ClickUp pipeline was just to make my life a little bit easier. Um, essentially, I... I was creating short form content for my long form videos over here. And then I had, you know, a bunch of content over here with like a pre-generated uh, frame.io folder. It's not super relevant or important. So let me just run you through what the flow itself looks like. We are watching actor runs and then we're getting some data set items. This is just fancy terminology for basically, um, you know, getting like getting the actual data. We're then creating a Google Drive for every new video. And then we are creating a ClickUp task. And then at the very end, I sleep just because I had some API stuff. So if I were building the system right now, where would I start? Well, I'd actually start with the ClickUp node or module. I would actually go and I'd create a task in ClickUp and I'd verify that I could fill all of the fields that I want in my space. And once I've done that, that's easy as hell. Now I just work backwards. Okay, well, one of the fields is going to have to be a Google Drive, right? Fantastic. I'm going to create a Google Drive folder. Okay, well, obviously I'm going to need the name of the video in order to do that. So what do I have to do? I have to scrape the data set items. This is just a long and roundabout way of me really driving home that point. But essentially, you should always just be starting at the end and then working your way back from the end to the very beginning. If you do that, you'll be able to build your systems, I want to say, at least twice as fast. And more importantly, you're going to be doing so in a directed way that doesn't like, you know, uh, have you result in dead end after dead end after dead end that makes you want to tug your freaking hair out, as I'm sure we're all familiar with. Okay, the second major point is test-driven development. When you are building a flow or an automation, test every module one by one. Don't go ahead of yourself and add 10 modules or nodes and then click test and then try and see the output, but actually just do it one module or node at a time. The value here is if you test things one node or module at a time, the second that there's an error, you will know exactly where that error comes from. Sounds simple, right? Hypothetically, if I were TDD, test-driven development, if I were testing a flow, and I'm just going to build this out and, you know, me drawing, because I've actually gotten pretty good at drawing here. I like to think so anyway. Maybe people that disagree can tell me. If this is step one, if this is step two, if this is step three, okay, what you do is all of these work. We verified. We've got the expected outputs at every step, right? Well, what happens when we add step four and then it doesn't work? 
Where is the error, logically? Well, the error is obviously right over here. There's some issue with the data that you are putting from three, two, or one into four, right? It's that simple. You don't have to jump around to every single node in your flow. You don't have to wonder uh, if, you know, uh, you don't have to jump from one scenario or workflow to another scenario or workflow. You know exactly where this error occurred. It occurred somewhere right around here, realistically. So you then just check out the data that came out of um, node three. And you say, is this expected data? Is this what I wanted? And then you check the data that goes into node four and you say, is this expected data? Is this what I wanted? And ultimately you find that it is not. There will be some issue there, whether a syntax error or maybe some data field is empty or whatever. You'll know exactly how to convert this from something that doesn't work into something that works. And then you can just continue, right? And then you do number five, right? That works. Then all of a sudden you do number six. But for some weird reason, when you do number six, there's an error. Well, where's the problem? It's probably somewhere right over here, right? Logically. Now, obviously, there's some nuance here. Data at six can access data back at five, four, three, two, or one, and basically any automation tool. But the point that I'm making is you will know that that is the node or the workflow or the module that you need to be spending your time on fixing. The biggest issue that I find when people design workflows is they will get ahead of themselves and then they'll assume things. They'll say, oh, well, this makes sense. That's logical. I get it. Of course that makes, you know, I, I totally got this. I'm going to add this node, then that node, then that node, then that node. They add five or 10 of them in a row and then something breaks. And then when something breaks, they freak the hell out because it could be anywhere. So essentially um, what debugging is, is debugging is just a giant, massive um, like search tree. Okay. Basically you have so many different options here, so many different places that your automation could break. And trust me, this is going to get somewhere. You have, you know, out of, uh, I don't know, how many nodes are we down now? Like, uh, you know, if this is node one, there's an input and then an output. If this is node two, there's an input and output. This goes to node three, input, output. There, there's like, I don't, I don't know, combinatorially here, there's 15 separate areas where you could make a mistake. Instead of looking over all of these 15 areas, what you want to do is you want to cut your time down and you only want to look at the one that you know is the problem. If you do it this way, you will save yourself uh, 15 sixteenths of your time. Okay. It's obviously not one for one. I'm just modeling this and trying to give you guys an example, but you will save the overwhelming majority of all of the time that you are spending doing all of this flowing and debugging and, and banging your head against the wall and tearing your hair out if you do test-driven development. Now, the main retort to this is, Nick, I don't really like testing every node or module because it just takes me a little bit more time. But just keep in mind that this is a fixed time sink. You know, This is 30 seconds here in order to test. This is another 30 seconds. This is another 30 seconds. You know how much time it's going to take and it's fairly fixed to do the testing. This right over here, this is a completely unknown amount of time. This could take you five hours to comb through. So you might as well restrict your search to the node that probably matters the most, which is you know that last one. The last major principle that I use and that I teach to people both in my communities and that I consult with outside of my communities is don't solve every edge case unless you know that you have to. Now, I'm bringing this up because a lot of people that get into no code, they do so from a programmer's mentality. They do so because they went to computer science school and their teacher said, hey, when you design a system or create an algorithm, that system or algorithm has to solve everything in the whole wide world. And if it doesn't, it's not correct. Okay. The thing is, automations aren't an academic exercise. The purpose of an automation is usually to drive some sort of business value in the real world. In the real world, in theory, two very big different things. So when you're working in the real world, you can design a system that even if your system doesn't work on all of the data types, or all of the situations, or all of the possible hypothetical pieces of input and output that come into it, 
it doesn't actually matter because it's still driving a return on investment, an ROI. And what you'll find is that's basically all business owners care about. They want a system where you put in X dollars, they could <laughs> could not give less of a crap about what goes on inside of here. And then what they want is they just want some system that produces some constant times the money that they put in, C just being some number, three, four, 10, 500. So what they want is they want a system where they put $1 inside and then it becomes $5, okay? Whatever the hell's going on over here, they, they, they couldn't care about. If your system isn't perfect, they don't care. The only thing that they care about is, does this decision, the in order to get Nick to build it for me, or um, in order for me to pay my staff member to do this, or, or whatever, is this decision making me more money than it's costing me? So if you can dial back all of the complexity for a customer or a client, and if you can build a system in five minutes, okay, that does 90% of the job, and then if you could theoretically solve the other 10%, but it would take you 100 hours, then just do what you have to do in five minutes. Test it out, see how it goes. See how it works in your business or see how it works for the customer's business. And then, and only then, if there's some sort of issue, you can work on improving it or reinvesting some of those funds to make the system even better. So don't try solving for all edge cases. You probably don't need to. Okay, great. I hope you guys appreciated and enjoyed this video. I know this one was definitely on the shorter side, but just testing out a new recording setup and seeing how things go. If you have any questions about what I talked about today, feel free to drop me down a comment. We're than happy to help. I source a lot of my video ideas directly from my lovely audience at this point. So please, really, I could do a video on what you comment like tomorrow uh, if you give me something good and juicy. Otherwise, if you could do me a big solid, like, subscribe, do all the fun YouTube stuff that bumps me to the top of the algo, and I'll catch you on the next video. Thanks so much.